So I'm going to get started. I know we're going to have people sporadically coming in throughout the evening just due to timing and traffic, but it's important we get things going and we keep the trains running on time because we have a lot to cover. First of all, Jason Dodier, co-founder of Fountainhead Rhode Island and Great Ecosystem. It's really a privilege to be here. Uh, I would say distinguished guests, esteemed state business leaders, it's a privilege that I stand before you at this magnificent venue. And this is the perfect venue to do an event such as this. And it feels like just yesterday, we were discussing the idea of hosting a climate-focused event to showcase the remarkable efforts that have been underway here in the state of Rhode Island over the last several decades. A couple of points I want to call out. The first law of ecology imparts a profound truth. Everything is connected to everything else. As we convene here today, I am struck by the profound interconnectedness of our world and the crucial role we all play in shaping the future. Coming together marks a beginning, staying together signifies progress, and working together epitomizes success. This ethos drives the mission of Fountainhead Rhode Island and fuels our daily efforts at Grain Ecosystem, where we work hard to accelerate supply chain waste decarbonization. With that sentiment, I will now yield the floor to a cherished friend, mentor, and inspiring leader for the state of Rhode Island, our speaker, Joe Shikarchi. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to stay seated, so thank you. Jason, thank you. Thank you for who you are, for what you do. Thank you for bringing this wonderful conference to Rhode Island, and thanks for spearheading this effort. I have some very brief remarks, and then unfortunately I have to leave. Uh, I'm leaving out of town this evening, but I wanted to be here, so I rearranged my schedule. And before I get with my remarks, I certainly want to acknowledge, you know, we've done a lot of great things in the environment in the last three years in the state of Rhode Island, and a lot of that information, a lot of that uh, great work we've done has emanated from the House, and it does not happen without my majority leader, Chris Blazajewski, and our champion of the House, Lauren Carson. Lauren is the author, yes, please applaud her, absolutely. Lauren will be on the panel and you'll hear from her directly and I encourage you to engage with her. She is bright, she is smart, she is talented, and long before she ever got involved in politics, she's been an environmentalist. When it wasn't in fashion to be an environmentalist, she cares about it, but more than caring about it, she knows how to get it done. And Lauren is up one of the crown jewels that we have in the house, but especially on environmental issues. She takes on the most difficult issues, whether it's study commissions where people don't even speak to each other or get along, or whether she's fighting all kinds of riptides in the house, and we can be a, a pretty turbulent place. Lauren navigates it, gets it done, and gets it done well. Lauren, thank you for what you do and continue to do. Chris Blazajewski, my right hand, my best friend, all good things come in the house that come in the house have come from Chris. And uh, he has been a champion on the environment, not only the act on climate, but so many other things that I'll touch upon in a minute. And I want to recognize two other uh, leaders from the state who work in the state. And certainly, I cannot not recognize my good friend and really the guardian of the environment Rhode Island, Terry Gray, the director of DEM. Terry has had a distinguished career at DEM. A distinguished career for, I don't even want to say how many years, a lot of years, and he continues to effectively operate that department, and I have a lot of faith and confidence. And when Terry comes to me and he says, Speaker, I need four new jobs of FTEs, we call them full-time equivalents, the new jobs to protect the environment, I know he needs it, and I know it's real. Other, other directors come and they say, I need eight, or they really need four. Uh, Terry always tells it the way it is, and 90% of the time he gets what he asks for because he does a good job. It's not because I like him, which I do, it's because he does a good job. And of course, Chris Kearns is here from OER, the Office of Energy Regulation, does a great job with a lot of our electrification and uh, electric cars and battery operating stations and all this wonderful stuff, he does a great job. And we have from the business community, Melissa Travis, who gets it done. And then our friends in the labor community, I don't see him, I know he's here, I saw him walk in, Pat Crowley, who I'm proud to say in, in many ways is a good friend, but there he is, next to Chris, hiding behind the camera, but is also on the EC forum. Pat gets it, and so does Melissa, that being a good environmentalist doesn't mean you're anti-labor. Being a good environmentalist doesn't mean you're anti-business. Uh, 
they can and they should and they have to coexist. And that's the way we're gonna get good things done, by working together. So I really wanna thank everybody for being here. Rhode Island has had a rich history and it continues to do so. Last year, noted historian, um, author, and environmentalist Doug Sprinkley came to Rhode Island to the State House to recognize what we as a small state did on the act on climate. In our state, we have 37 miles of length, 48 miles of width, and that's significant because we're a very small state, but we have 400 miles of, of coastline in Rhode Island, if you can believe it. It's scary to believe that. And in my own hometown, we have 39 miles of coastline, and we see and we feel, and I see and I feel, uh, beach erosion and climate change and sea level rise. It's real and it's happening, and that's why we need to address it. But we need to address it in a way that makes sense for with this, the, the current station where we are in our economy and our life, but also looking at it from a future standpoint. How is this going to affect our children? our grandchildren in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. And that's what the Afghan climate has done and continues to do. As I said before, the General Assembly has taken the lead in many areas and Lauren Carson has been at the forefront of that. We have made uh, banning styrofoam a priority. We have adopted the Ocean State Climate uh, Resilience Fund as a way to pay and fund many environmental stuff at EC4. Some of our other reps have worked hard banning PFAS in food packaging and putting PFAS restrictions on our drinking water. Uh, we continue to, with Chris Collins' help, electrifying the state's roadways and creating an infrastructure of charging for uh, electric cars and electric batteries as we move forward. And as many of you who don't know me, but some of you who do, you will know that my top priority is housing. And why I mention that is, Housing is not, again, mutually exclusive to a good environment. You can have good housing production and still be sustainable in the environment. In the state of Rhode Island, in the house in particular, we received an award for the Green Buildings Act. We were one of the first states to initiate it in 2009. We updated it in 2017 and again last year. And last year, we've won awards on the Green Buildings Act. When we've aligned ourselves with the executive climate change Coordinating Council, which is the EC4. Some of the legislative area wins were not just about legislation or about that we passed. It's about bad legislation that we stopped. And with Lita Blazajewski's help, the two of us, after the other chamber in, in Rhode Island passed a, they, they used it, the word advanced recycling, but it was a plastics burning incinerator bill. It was Chris Blazajewski who led the charge to defeat that in the House because it was bad for business and bad for the environment. And I want to thank Chris for that. I want to acknowledge that it's not always what we do, it's what we prevent from happening. So Chris, thank you again. And I'll give you a brief shout out. Those are just some of the points I want to talk about, but you know, I want to also focus on the business aspect. The business aspect of green energy, green jobs, because that's where the future is. We can coexist. We can have beautiful water fire, not just this wonderful exhibit, but and also do wonderful things for the environment. We've done some great things in Rhode Island. We're gonna continue to, to work hard with that. We have great growth in our companies here. And I know a lot of you are from the business world today, looking at you know it's green energy, green economy, how can I benefit? And that's a great thing. We have, I want to point out just one example in Rhode Island. We have a company called Utilidata. It, for lack of a better word, because I'm very elementary in this stuff, they make very smart and sophisticated um, thermometers and electric um, routers that work with the grid so that we can get electricity extremely effectively. It, it's, a, it's a startup company that's doing phenomenal things. Microsoft is investing in them. NVIDIA is investing in them. They're based here in Rhode Island. Josh Kuberg, who was a friend of mine I worked with, and Amy Moses, who left the environmental community to walk and, walk and work into the corporate world, but did so with keeping her environmental conscious. So Amy, thank you for that wonderful company, and we're expecting good things from Utilidata as you move forward. Not only here in Rhode Island, but nationally. They're a national leader. We're doing, we're on the cusp of so many great things, I'm going to conclude my remarks and, and, and uh, excuse myself, but to say 
thank you for your uh, being here. Thank you for bringing Jason this wonderful event to Rhode Island. Founding it in Rhode Island, can, can he, by this guy's been all over the world talking about environmental sustainability and pro-business environment all over the world. I was in New York City last week with him. He's, he's well respected, he's well known, and he's a Rhode Islander, and he remembers and he always comes back to his roots. So Jason, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Please continue to do what you do. Not only is it good politics, it's good business, it's good for the environment, and we need it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, so I'll continue with the seated situation, I think. That sounds good. Um, my name is Jeannie Salo. I'm the Chief Public Policy Officer for a company called Schneider Electric. Anybody who has heard of Schneider Electric? Oh my god, I love that! Um, so I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I, I, I talk about public policy all the time. That's my job. I, um, I, I sit with you know people in Washington. I, I get to all the states. But Schneider Electric has a huge footprint in the United States of America and a very large footprint here in New England and in Rhode Island we have so many employees. So I'm glad that many people know who we are because some people don't. Um, so I just went to the gift shop around the corner and I bought these new earrings. They're fire, actual symbols. I encourage you to go check out the gift shop and maybe to see if there's any cool art stuff in there. It's an amazing space and I'm very happy to be here. But I got the fire earrings. And I'm wondering if some people might think, does that mean the planet is on fire? Are we doing wildfires in California? What's the theme there? No, I want you to take away from that the fact that I think climate policy is on fire, metaphorically. Here in Rhode Island, uh, there's incredible leadership. We just heard about it. We are seeing some of the most significant transformational policy happen right now. And that's kind of what I want to talk about. We have a lot of work to do, but there's a lot that good that has happened. And so, um, just a few more words about Schneider Electric. We're an electrification company, digitization, automation company, software company, and a sustainability consulting company. So we're very interested in doing this for ourselves, setting targets, meeting them, doing it for our customers, our partners. Um, but we also just genuinely believe in this. We think it's really good for the planet. Uh, we're a purpose-driven company. and. It's our passion. So um, I'm really happy to be here and talking to all of you because I think that this is a group of people who are also passionate. Um, you're activists and you're doing something about it. Um, and it's really meaningful. So I want to talk about the good news because we just had Earth Day on Monday. And it was like, it, you know that it was like our 50th Earth Day? I don't know if people, it's like a little over 50 years of doing Earth Day. We put our stuff up at Facebook or LinkedIn, and there's a picture of a planet or the Earth, and you're thinking about the impacts on this planet. But 50 years, and there's a tendency to say nothing's happening. Like this is not happening fast enough. We're, you know, there's a, there's obviously we know there's a lot of concern, and that's justified and important. But I do want to put a spin on this. Um, there's another thing that had happened about 50 years ago. Does anybody want to guess? 50 years ago, there's another major thing, transformation that started 50 years ago. Any guesses? That's a good guess. Very good. Not climate related, but is climate related. It's a little tricky one. I'm just going to tell you. Oh. No, no, but that's, what's your guess? No, God, now, now you're giving me a lot of good stuff here. Um, age of information. In about 50 years ago, there were several of us getting our first home personal computer. You had to get five of your closest friends to move it from one side of the house to the other if you ever wanted to put it on a different desk. And look at us today. We've got smartphones, we've got the Apple Watch, everything's connected. It's actually over. The age of information is over. Now it's the age of Internet of Things, industrial Internet of Things. That was 50 years. Um, there's a famous uh, economist called um, Rudy Dornbush, and he said, um, things take a lot longer than you think they would, but then they go a lot faster than you think they could. And I'm just gonna let that sit there. They, it sounds kind of like you're like, what? No, things take a lot longer than you think they would, and then they happen a 
a lot faster than you think they could. I want you to correlate the age of information to that. That is where we are. We are in a new industrial revolution and we're at the tipping point. We're not at the tipping point. We're falling. We're falling way over and soon we're going to be all the way, okay? What, what actually, what is the evidence of that? I'm going to talk through a few things. So, this is a demand-driven transformation, just like the information age, but it is accelerated by public policy. We will solve climate change, that's the good news. We have the technology now, actually. Many of the companies in this room have technology right now that if you deployed it at scale would have a massive impact on climate change and, and mitigate a lot of the crisis. So we can do it, because we're also innovating all the time. There's companies in this room that need to go further and they're gonna do the next thing. We have the technology, we're innovating the next level of technology. So we are going to solve it. That's the good news. It is just a matter of how fast. And so everybody has got to stop talking about the doom and gloom piece and say, how do we accelerate it? Because we're all, we're ready, we have many of the components, we just have to go faster. So demand-driven transformation accelerated by public policies. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the policies at the federal level because Jason made the mistake of giving me a microphone and he told me that I could go a little longer than I had originally planned. Um, policies at the federal level over the last through few years, right? Infrastructure Modernization Act, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, about $2 trillion Guys, I'm gonna say this, because I don't know if people say this enough. This is the single most significant investment in climate, wait for it, in the world, in the world. See, we like to talk about, like, we did a whole big thing in the United States, but it is the biggest investment in climate in the world. And we're like, it's not far enough, and it didn't go far enough, and there's a lot of complaining we could do, but let's take a moment to just reflect on that. That happened in the last two years, okay? Tipping point. Um, there were billions of dollars in that package to electrify ports, airports, transportation, build out the EV infrastructure, incentivize industrial carbonization, get cleaner homes, incentivize strengthening supply chains. Shire Electric, on just us, have invested $440 million in more supply chain capacity to meet the growing demand, and like, we're not done. Um, modernizing the grid. Then you have on top of that, tailwind, $700 billion in private investments since that, two years ago stuff. Um, and nearly half of Fortune 500 companies have made my major climate commitments. And they're now getting a little more science target based. They're getting, they're getting better. Some of them are backing off, but no, they're actually realizing that no, we really need to be accountable. So we're gonna make them better and fix them. And it's growing. Um, and the state and local policy, which we can celebrate Rhode Island, because they're really doing some amazing things, tip of the spear things, is accelerating this action even further. And so we have 33 states that have climate action plans. 24 states have greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. Rhode Island is doing both. Rhode Island is leading by example. The government, governor signed the lead by example order. Um, it sets lower state energy consumption, targets for state energy agency, fossil fuel emissions reductions, use of zero emission vehicles, installation of EV charging stations. Rhode Island has the 2025 strategy to implement its climate targets. I'm not going to do this because you're going to talk more about what you're doing and things like that, so I won't go on and on. Um, but Rhode Island is the tip of the spear in, in implementing and accelerating what we need to do. And states are partnering with other states. And in New England, that's happening to accelerate deployment. So we're not at the tipping point. We're sliding, we're sliding, and the investments are helping. And we're gonna keep going, and we're in a completely new industrial revolution. And it's economically very attractive. Economically attractive, because this is the way it's going. Just like the information age, new tech, a whole new level of competitiveness, and the world is changing. And I think it's very exciting, um, very exciting stuff. And so I'll leave you with this. This repeating the quote from The Economist, things take a lot longer than you think they would, 
and then they happen a whole lot faster than you think they could. And the difference here is gonna be how fast we can do things in Rhode Island and, and drive by example and lead by example and show other states what's possible. And it's the people in this room that have the capability to do that. And you guys are pretty amazing. I'm very honored to be with this group that you're here tonight. I'm super proud that Jason um, invited me to come up and I don't know why I got picked. I'm thankful. I'm, thank you for listening to me. But I hope you feel optimistic because it's easy to get pessimistic. But we're, we're really seeing something incredible here happening and we can keep pushing it a lot farther with this group in Rhode Island and then go further. And the last thing I'll say is people always ask about elections. Well, Jeannie, what's gonna happen with the presidential elections? Are we gonna just, we did climate, then we did do climate, and then we did climate, and then we didn't do climate. And I usually get those questions from Europeans or people in other countries that are confused by our uh, government's pendulum swinging thing. And I, the way I answer that is if we are doing what we are doing here in Rhode Island in the private sector and at the state and local levels, it doesn't matter we will continue to drive the progress. It's not something that's reversible. And so we have a lot of good news and we've got a lot more to do to accelerate it. And on that note, I don't know where Jason is. I don't know what happens next. There he is. Here we go. Yeah, uh, I'm excited. And, and a big hand for Jesus all, by the way, for coming in to be here. And as we ready the stage for our first panel of the evening, thank you so much. I'll just echo the sentiments. There are very few people in the country that have more policy experience than Jeannie. She was just with Secretary Granholm only a couple of weeks ago. And I encourage you all to find some time if you get a chance. Meet with Jeannie, she's gonna be sticking around for a little bit. I, I hopefully. Am. I, I, I and wanna take his group selfie. I'm gonna be a total <laughs> person. I'll say, hi, get in there. Yay, I'll, I'll be like, remember when, you know, in five years when Rhode Island has done even more. So on that note, Scott, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Maybe you want to come on up, introduce your panelists, and we're going to pull in our banner, which has finally arrived. This banner has been with us almost since the beginning. So happy to have the banner here. And Scott, I'll turn the mic over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm very, very excited to, uh, to be here tonight. I want to give a shout out to Jason's dad because he's done a wonderful job. This is just a little, I sound like I'm around nosy, but I speak to thousands of people over the last six years, just calling them, putting together meetings. I call Jason, right, and I had this thing with millennials, like they kind of annoy me because they never call you back. Jason calls me back every time, within a second. Scott, let's go, let's do this. It's just the opposite of like hiding behind emails and LinkedIn and everything. The guy gets back to you, like right away. So anyway, good job, Dad. <laughs> Um, anyway, okay. So I just want to introduce up here uh, some wonderful speakers. I'm very humbled to have this panel moderated. We have Kerry Constabile. She made sure it was Italian. And she's the vice chair, okay, and senior climate expert at Gold Standard and the former head of sustainability and strategy at Google. And she's also was an advisory group leader at SBTI has an incredible background. Thank you very much for joining us, Kevin. I also have uh, Peter Pete Short, the principal from Broadscale Group. He's on the venture capital investing side of climate change. Another brilliant mind here. And then I have last but not least, Stephen Rothstein, the managing director of Ceres, who's an expert on policy. And we're gonna be going over a lot of different things that are happening today in the United States, and uh, let's kick it off. Carrie, how are you? Good, Scott. Good, how nice are you? to meet you. You always do the Zoom calls and you meet them in person. And it's like, you know, they look much more attractive than their LinkedIn profile. <clears throat> okay, so let's start off with net zero. It's kind of a trigger word because my company's called Companies for Net Zero. It sets people off those two words, net zero. How would you describe the global state of net zero today? This is a three part question. But I'm gonna just start off with that part. What is the state of net zero globally today from your lens? So net zero, just to level set, what the, the leading science authority, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says, the world needs to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030 against um, 
you know, 1990, or, yeah, basically 2000 baseline, which is, and then get to net zero by 2050. And so that is, that is reducing, it basically getting a balance of emissions and removing what's in the air and, and that, and that is the way to keep climate change and, and global warming we're under 1.5 degrees. So limiting, limiting the increase below 1.5 degrees Celsius. We are not in a bad place. I would say, you know, so we're in a place where nine, over 90 countries now have set net zero targets. We've got thousands of cities, states, and companies that have set net zero targets. So we're not in a bad place, but we are completely off track to to meet the 1.5 degree threshold for the world, and and uh, you know, so there is there is that doom and gloom, but there is a lot of positive momentum, and you know, so I think there's tons of reason to be optimistic. Firstly, I mean, when you're looking at all of the industries, we need to electrify the world. Uh, we're looking at solar panels that have decreased in prices by 90% over the last decade, wind 60% over the last decade. Electric vehicles are almost as you know the same price as engines, internal combustion engines. So, in terms of global net zero, you know, we're off track, but we're seeing so many bright lights that can be scaled, and really, I mean, the the potential to get to net zero is within reach, and I think that's what we really have to focus on. So here's another question. So we have geothermal, we have solar, we have battery storage, we have, you know, tidal, wind, all of these different technologies. And what in EV charging, what sector are you most optimistic in? And then the other part of this is, wh where do you see the greatest bottlenecks ex existing that can get unlocked over the next few years? So. Uh, energy in general, I'm quite optimistic. I would say I'm most optimistic about electrification. There are, and, and I think we have a lot of experts here that know the permitting problem challenges to really decarbonize the grid, and that's that's a real bottleneck. But I am very optimistic about electrification and electric vehicles, where the industries that I think need a lot more investment and attention really are like what I call the built environment and everything that you need in a built in, in the built environment. So that's cement, steel, everything that's that's here. It's really hard to electrify those industries. And we're looking at at a you know a, a growing US but but more than that we're looking at a growing world where we're seeing urbanization I mean, we're going to see those materials at least double between now and 2050. So we've re really got to invest in in cement, steel, and those built environment materials. That's th those are the hardest, the hard to abate is what they're called. So where's the where are the bottlenecks that exist? Like to get those are the bottlenecks. Those are the so bottlenecks. That would, I would say the biggest bottleneck is really getting enough funding and enough investment and enough technological innovation to develop and and invest in 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 those what, what we call hard to abate sectors of so cement steel concrete and especially in the regions of the world like asia that are going to be needing them the most that's that's the biggest uh, i will say another bottleneck that i think is really important and and where we need a state like Rhode Island to show the way is getting funding to the local, the most local levels. So we can't just have funding stuck at the federal level in any country, but especially the U.S. We really need funding to get to communities, to get to the community, you know, to everything from a contractor that's building a new building, and that is quite important. It's really it, oftentimes what you see is that funds don't get dispersed quickly enough. And so the transition isn't happening quickly enough. Great, thank you. Now we're, now we're gonna go over to Pete. Hi Pete. Hello, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, very good, nice to meet you in person. Likewise, that was a wonderful frame by the way. I could, I could riff off that for a while if you want. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we, we, we hear about, you know, trillions of dollars of capital yeah. sitting on the sidelines. You know, I've heard there's, there's a lot of inertia with the capital getting injected for these projects. What role, from your lens, in terms of venture-backed teams and solutions, 
you know, what, what, yeah. what role is, is, is your, your role, uh, what are you playing in that role as a venture back yeah. when you look at the big banks if you can unpack that for scaling climate solutions and investing? Sure. Yeah. sure. Well, Kerry, I, I thought that was a terrific frame. Cause, so I, I sit in the seat of the venture capitalists based in New York, but we love backing teams all around the country, including in, in Rhode Island. And I, I see the biggest challenge from our perspective is taking the solutions that you described, Kerry, and scaling them from zero to one, right? Which is actually sort of a software, you know, Silicon Valley style concept, right? But zero to one in climate looks very different from zero to one in software, right? So zero to one in software, you could have a guy and a gal in a garage and a dog, right? Scaling the solution all around the world by the cloud. And, and in climate, it really takes, you know, years of R&D work, years of capital investment, and ultimately products. I think one of the things that's lost when we talk about climate is most climate companies, probably the majority of them, are actually project development businesses. They're going to monetize that through, you know, at scale project deployment. So, similar to, to a lot of the remarks already today, I'm incredibly optimistic about the solutions that are coming down the pipeline, but now it's the deploy phase. You know, we've had about $40 billion invested in the last three years into corporate equity in climate solutions, which is a staggering sum. It, you know, I've been in climate since about 2012. And the amount of investment cumulatively, I would say, between 2012 and say 2021 was maybe a couple billion. So we basically 40 x you know, conservatively in three years, uh, that total amount of deployment. But the time now is really to figure out how do we find product market fit, again, another Silicon Valley concept for climate solutions. And again, it's different for climate than for software, right? And I like that parallel. And, and the way to find product market fit in climate is we need to, where we can, get climate solutions to be economic and below the, the, the price of the incumbent, usually fossil-based solutions. So Karen, you were talking about built environment materials. You know, we need to have zero carbon uh, or low embodied carbon, cement, steel, that's price and cost competitive, right? We need to have electrified buildings that are cheaper to run and cheaper to, to, to heat and, and to cool uh, than, than by the fossil and gas-based solution. We're, we're getting there, it's taking time, but it's the entrepreneurial teams that have sought up that 40 billion of capital in the last three years that are now getting to work uh, on all of that, and, and I see that really as the, as the opportunity. I have a quick question before I ask this question to you for the audience. How many of you have heard of Local Law 97? If you can raise your hands. Okay. And how many people have heard of Birdo? Nice. All right. And how many of you have heard of Beps? Okay, not bad. All right. I'm a press Rhode Island. All right. So, <laughs> okay. So, I just want to ask, ask that question. It's interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you, Pete, how, how are they helping to implement and deploy, from your lens, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act on the federal level? Um, yeah. Locally, how do we deploy Local Law 97 in Birdo? And, and uh, on the state level, California is leading with SB 251 and 261. So all these incentives, the carrot and stick approach, from your lens, how do we tie all three together to drive change, uh, climate change initiatives? Yeah, so it's been really interesting to see from the venture seat, right? Because I think operators, for example, say building portfolio owners, REITs, you know, a law like Local Law 97 gets passed, and then they look around and they're like, how do we comply with this? We can't even, you know, measure today what's happening in our building portfolio. You can't manage what you can't measure, right? So. Usually it's venture-backed solutions, in my perspective, in the likes of Google and other large tech codes, to develop solutions to help you comply with these laws. And so there's a really nice kind of hand-in-glove relationship, in my perspective, between regulators who are being very proactive here in the States, at the local level, the federal level, uh, and in Europe, and venture-backed teams, which are then meeting the technological challenge of how do we actually comply uh, with, with, with some of these. So, uh, already highlighted to, today were a lot of ways in which Rhode Island is leading the charge and is the tip of the spear. I, I encourage that, I welcome that, because I think for every progressive law on climate, there's usually an entrepreneurial team there to meet the challenge uh, to actually implement those laws. It's funny, I feel like sometimes these two sides don't really talk to one another that closely, but they're actually collaborating after the fact. And so there's probably an opportunity to bring forward that collaboration during the, the lawmaking process and, and, and to be a bit more integrated. But we're seeing, you know, with Local Law 97, which I believe was passed in 2020, 
uh, there's already been a great role played by venture-backed teams to build the software for, say, portfolio managers to understand their exposure and how to comply now that it's been implemented. So it's been a really interesting relationship, and I think in, in some ways that's the heart of climate innovation is private sector and public sector acting together in innovative ways. Nice. Stephen, how are you? Good, thank you. Excellent. Nice to meet you. Can you hear me? Oh, here you yes. Yeah, we are here. Great. So um, there's a lot of uh, you know misconceptions about the new SEC ruling. Um, from your lens and your expertise, where, where do you see the new SEC, uh, the impact of the new SEC uh, regulation? And then also tying in California, which is like almost a country of itself with SBT 253 and 261. You know, what roles will they play and, and why are they so important to Rhode Island and, and, and to the, the businesses that are in Rhode Island? Absolutely, no, it's a great question. Thank you and thank you for hosting and, and for all of you for coming out. Um, as you just said, you can't manage what you can't measure. And investors have been saying that they have enormous risks in the portfolio. So they're trying to decarbonize their portfolio. So that um, our first meeting with the SEC was in 2003 uh, with investors. And so this has been growing and growing and growing. Right now, investors representing about $70 trillion. Let me say that again. $70 trillion of assets who have said to the SEC they want information. So for the SEC, it'll cover just the largest companies, um, the around 8,000 companies around the country, um, and, and it doesn't force them to do anything, take any action, it just forces disclosure. Then it's up to all of you. It's up to investors, employees, customers, suppliers, to make choices, and those are already happening. I just talked to a farmer the other day who by, because they're sharing their climate information, they're getting a 20 cent premium on, per bushel. So there's an incentive for information. Same with California. California's passed two laws um, that one, one's for companies that are a billion dollars or more and one's for half a billion. When I say California, you say, well, you're in Rhode Island, why does it matter? Because it doesn't matter where you're incorporated, as long as you're doing business in California. And most large companies are doing business. Because if California were its own country, it, they would be the fifth largest country in the world. So we believe disclosure is critical, but I would encourage all of you, if you want to think about well, what can I do to make an impact? First is, if you work for a company, or if you buy stuff from a company, ask them, what are they doing about climate disclosure? Second is, if you want to join with us, we're getting people to write letters and participate in all kinds of ways to support that. Because there is, just as much as I'm an optimist, I think you're right, there's a lot of good things, there are a lot of other people who are pushing on the other side. These are, I just asked during, before, how would I describe this world? I think the United States and climate is the best of times and the worst of times. I'm not the first one to have said that. Um, that there's a lot of amazing things happening in Rhode Island, nationally, and many other states. But there are a lot of stuff pushing back, and I can talk about that if there's time. So these two are important. They don't, de disclosure does not decarbonize, but you can't decarbonize without disclosure. I have another question for you. Like I've been to many conferences this year. I've actually had people say to me, "Don't bring up ESG. Like, don't say it. Right? Like, if you say it, we'll kick you out. Right? So it's like you know, say like the Beetlejuice shit three times, you go to hell or something. Right? ESG, ESG. Um, many states are pushing for anti-ESG legislation. So, from your lens, what do you think about these bills? From from your lens, and I'm probably opening up a big can of worms here. But yeah. So first, let me just take a step back. We did some national polling. 75% of people, when you ask them what those three letters mean, they have no idea what you're talking about. And of those who do know, it's more negative because of the political debate. We're the only country that has this political debate. But when you ask them those same polls, do you think a company should be profitable and care about water? Profitable and care about diversity? Care about the future? Care about climate? Over 90% Democrats and Republicans all say yes. So there's broad support for the underlying issues. There isn't support for the acronym. So we started this initiative called Freedom to Invest. And I actually have more buttons. If anyone wants one later, I'm happy to get you one. Because we believe that companies and investors, whether those investors are the city of Providence or a small company or an individual or a big company, should be free to think about risks and opportunities. There are bills that are, what do I think about them? A lot of them are just stupid, um, to be clear. I'll give you two examples. State of New Hampshire introduced a bill, it died, 
but it said if you are company and if you have an ESG policy, you're on, you can, it can be a felony. A felony. Okay? Another state has a Texas uh, passed a law that said if you're a bank and had an ESG policy, you cannot bid on municipal work. So that meant they had six banks before, and banks that were banned, these are mainstream banks. Bank of America, Wells Fargo City. These are not left-wing banks, let me tell you. Um, they do some great things on climate, but they also finance a lot of oil stuff. So Texas ended up with one bank. They're gonna spend $270 million more in interest costs. So these bills are costing state taxpayers money. So we fundamentally think, we believe in the marketplace. If there's good information, and so we think that bills that are restrict um, investment, we don't support those. We support the freedom to invest, and the market is moving in that way. Companies representing trillions and trillions of dollars have set net zero plans. Um, none of them, from our perspective, are going fast enough, but compared to where we were five years ago, we're going light speed. Here, I'm going to throw the ball in your court. Now, you, you've had a, quite a few different roles, okay? Great roles. Corporate side, working with Google, working with Gold Standard, uh, running the initiatives for SBTI. From your lens, what can corporate leaders do to drive these initiatives forward? Just everybody, you know? It's, it's a really monumental task. But... And th there's so much. I think, you know, I completely agree with Stephen that disclosure is key, and I think, you know, th having, having disclosure rules that are powerful, like the one in California, <coughs> Or they really do push companies to to measure and to hold their own, you know, clean up their own house, so to speak. What I would say is that having done this, you know, recently um, for a couple of companies, is that you're also drowning in accounting and during in these companies. You really are, you know, it's it's because of because it's become so political. There's such a focus on the numbers and getting measurement right and measuring, you know, measuring every ounce of carbon correctly, which no one can do yet. I mean, we, we are not going to get the right numbers. We have to, that there's a, there's not enough investment in the R&D, in the innovation. So I would say there needs to be, I think for companies to do this really well, there needs to be investment in disclosure and measurement and there needs to be investment in innovation and they need to be balanced and i think right now there's a there's there's a bit too too much fear in getting the incorrect numbers and not enough bravery when it comes to innovation so that's i, I would yeah i think that's really important in terms of real corporate leadership i also think what's quite important <laughs> is is going beyond your own house and that was something that at in both of the companies, I've done this, you know, led net zero for two companies. And at Google, I mean, we were very focused on our own house and very focused on the energy that we consumed, the energy that we relied on for our data centers, etc. What was going into the Pixel phone, and all of that was incredibly important. But it was always also really important to, as a company, be a platform for changing the world. And so that's why you see energy efficient routes on Google Maps. And that's why we started something called Frontier, where we came together with three, four other companies to commit to one billion in carbon removal investments. And, and we created a, a coalition of other companies to, to invest in changing the grid called 24-7 Carbon Free Energy. Um, so I think what a lot of companies are focusing on their own house, which is, that's, that has to be bread and butter but take it another level and unite with other companies. And Schneider is doing an amazing job of this uh, with to change, to change the supply chain, change value chains, purchase together so that you're purchasing clean energy together and you're getting better prices and you're influencing your, your regulators you know, and your utilities to change as well. That's, that's what I think corporate leadership needs to get to those levels as well. And so it's what we're calling it, I think the climate community loves acronyms, beyond value chain. But it, it doesn't matter, it's just doing what, doing more than cleaning up your own house, I think is quite critical right now. I'll just share a really quick story, but I, I uh, hosted an event at Heinz, which is down at Greenwich Street in Manhattan in the Soho area. 
and they put in the first thermal energy network. And I said, thermal energy network, what is this about? You know, geothermal. So they connected three buildings with Heinz, Google, and Disney. And they're connecting the heat, the steam heat underneath the buildings. So when people aren't in the buildings, and I'll say this kind of in layman terms, they can heat the other buildings and even transfer heat to the other housing, like low income housing and, and other units. So imagine that, you can capture waste heat and transfer it over, and it's circular economy, it's energy efficiency used between buildings. And someone explained it to me and they said, you know how you give a person a hug and they can kind of you know, get warmth from their body? Well, it's like buildings hugging each other, right? And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, why are we doing that? Oh, well, they've been doing this for 60 years in Europe. Yeah. Like, and, and then I went, really? And the guy said it with like a Danish accent. I said, oh, it's fascinating. I said, why don't you Americans get it? And I mean, it kind of blew me away having coffee with this guy. But those are the type of things that are really exciting. Um, so, you know, it's like working in 19, I'm going to age myself, but I remember when I was getting fax orders on Wall Street and people were saying, oh, we'll never go to electronic trading. And they kept sending faxes in every day do their stock trades at 6 a.m. It's like, what are you doing? Like, get on the internet and start trading stocks. It's like people like, get, get, get with it with climate change, my goodness. Anyway, sorry. Um, Peter, I have a question for you. Sure, sure. Yes. Now, how do people get involved from your lens with the climate sector? What roles and opportunities are in venture capital? And, you know, how, how can people like, you know, jump in that sector to get involved? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and I actually think it dovetails a little bit with what we were talking about on the corporate commitment side. I mean, one, one of the things that has happened to corporate venture capital and down cycles, or say, more challenging economic cycles like we're in right now, is that frequently corporations retreat during those times because they look for ways to, to cut costs. And uh, I want to commend Schneider for not doing that. They have a terrific uh, corporate venture capital effort. There, there's, there's many others that have leaned in during this market moment because we know we're in a, a secular climate trend here that's, that's actually kind of counter-cyclical in a way. There's a lot of economic opportunity. Um, but taking a step back from that, you know, I think the, the opportunity to, to, particip to participate in climate is very much local. Um, as I look around the room, you know, there's an incredible uh, number of entrepreneurs and efforts happening just here in Rhode Island, and I would encourage folks wanting to roll their sleeves in climate to first look locally uh, as, as a first step. And then also to, to take an appraisal of what you know your unique strengths are just individually. Uh, I can't tell you the number of college classmates, friends of mine, you know, jumped into the climate sector after 10, 15 years outside of the climate sector. Uh, you know, and I think the climate sector and all of its constituent parts, which really is the whole economy, right, uh, have an opportunity for just about every skill set at, at this point. And so I would encourage folks to to, to really look at venture back teams as just one opportunity. There's also plenty of local workforce development opportunities. There's small and medium-sized businesses that have a climate angle, whether that's efficiency businesses, HVAC, you know, contractor businesses. We need to operationalize the climate transition at a local scale through, through a lot of effort. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot more roles that are climate aligned than people even realize. So, so I would encourage an imagination and, and also uh, taking stock of what's available in your own backyard. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, I have, Steve, I had a question for you. What financial risk do banks face nationally and in Rhode Island when it comes to you know climate risk, you know moving forward? What, what you know from your lens? Sure. Yeah. So we just wrote a piece about this. How many people here remember 2008 and and the the, the issues that we faced? Obviously, it affected the whole country for you know over a decade, affected the world. Well, today there is many times more climate risk in bank balance sheets than there was in 08 because of subprime housing. Wow. Many times more. Because what's happening is many of the banks don't understand. And you say, well, banks, it's a business. What, Rusty, what are you talking about? I've literally talked to, today I talked to the largest bank in the country. I talked to big banks, small banks, credit unions, and they don't measure climate risk in their portfolio enough. And so we hope that has, it would, you know, wouldn't happen. But if I said to you, imagine if an industry would turn away millions of customers, and then, for, like within a year, and then that industry would also double, triple, quadruple their prices. Oh, it wouldn't happen. Well, I've just defined the insurance industry. The insurance industry in the last 12 months has literally said no to millions of customers. 
No. Who doesn't? What business wants to say no to customers? And then yeah, I was in California for an insurance meeting a few weeks ago, where where I was talking to someone from the insurance department. They're getting rates. It used to be a thousand dollars for insurance. Now it's eight thousand. 15,000, it's not like 1,200, it's many times over. That is not sustainable. So that people now, if they've paid off their mortgage, are going bare on insurance. Imagine the mortgage markets in those communities. Imagine if you're a local bank. So that first is, I encourage all of you to go to the bank that you bank with and ask them, what are they doing to measure their climate risk? Um, the largest banks are doing a great job. Most of the other ones aren't doing as much. But also I encourage all of you in another area, to think about your retirement savings. Whether you're an individual, just an individual investor, you work for a company, you work for a city, 95% of people in the United States today, if they went to their employer and said, I want to have a climate-oriented fund, they won't have it, they don't have that option. And the average person working today will work for another 23 years. Imagine the world what's going to be like in 23 more years. So the Department of Labor passed a rule 15 months ago that allows people to do that. So I'm happy to talk more about it. But uh, so think about the retirement, think about the banking, um, and, and not just do it because it's good for environment, it is, but it's good for the safety and soundness of banks. The Federal Reserve, the chairman of the Federal Reserve has said climate is a risk. He hasn't said it as often as I want, but he said it, climate is a risk. And again, he doesn't think about it from an environmental perspective, from a safety and soundness of a bank perspective. Jason, how much time do we have left? This is like so much fun. We have some time for Q&A. We do? All right, good, good. Well, let's open it up to Q&A for the audience. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? No, yeah. Don't everybody raise their hand at once. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was uh, glad that you finally mentioned banking because uh, the big banks. Scott, here's Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so um, the big banks are the biggest funders of fossil fuels internationally, starting with JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo and Bank of America and Citibank. So climate risk, I'm kind of laughing at that because they're the ones who are funding the fossil fuels extraction and some of them are even doubling down on it now. I heard of Citizens is now coming in. So for any business, if you want to um, not negate everything you're doing to get to net zero, you need to decarbonize your banking right away. And until those um, funders of fossil fuels are feeling the pinch <laughs> of not having customers, um, fossil fuels are going to keep being extracted, keep being used, and it's just going to keep happening. Um, our own Peter Gilcase, who lives in Providence, started an organization called Bank Forward. And Bank Forward is funding um, the Carbon Bank Wall, so if you're interested, carbonbankwall.com. And it's a study looking at the major companies and an analysis of their emissions from operations worldwide based versus their banking. And what they found in almost every single case of the major um, public companies that they looked at that banking was negating their operational reduction of carbon 3 to 15 percent, depending upon the company. So, wonder what you might want to say about that. No, first, Bank Forward is a great organization. I completely agree with you. And we look at banks, it's not really the energy they use in their branches, it's what they, their loan to their companies. If you look at their portfolio, there's about 97 percent of their impact is the companies that they, they finance to. So yes, we want every bank grant to have solar and not use plastic and all those things, but that's a tiny, that's not the fundamental problem. And you're right, they need to stop. So one of the things that investors, we have a lot of investors on as part of our network that they've been pushing for this year is a funding ratio, basically to say, for every dollar, we'd like you to stop fossil fuel completely investing, but at least increase the ratio. So it should be four to one. So for every dollar you loan in a fossil fuel related, do four dollars in renewables. And that's a ratio that, so there's a, um, the six largest banks have that as part of their, if you're a shareholder and you go to one of their meetings, three of them have already agreed to it. We hope the others do. And again, we have a lot of information. You go to series.org, it's all free. Happy to talk more about banking. Banking and insurance 
that is the pipeline. I mean, every company needs banks, and every company needs insurance. Insurance is in a crisis now. I hope we're not in a place where, um, when Jason has this event in a few years, banks are in the crisis. But if we don't change something, it's going to be there. So thank you for your comment. Anyone have, anyone have a question? Here. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, um, so I was really interested in what you had to say about insurance. Um, I was just down in Fort Myers, Florida earlier this year and it was ravaged by Hurricane Ian. Um, there's several homeowners who have been left essentially homeless because uh, the insurance companies haven't given them their claims and <clears throat> this is a really big issue when it comes to um, essentially climate mitigation is that the cost of insurance, especially in coastal areas like Rhode Island and Florida, um, is becoming astronomical. So, I'm sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> so I guess my question is, um, what do you think about the potential for, you know, you think about the hot button issues that campaigns are running on, you know, immigration, um, but people don't really talk about insurance. It's kind of a boring thing to the general public. But what do you think about the potential for insurance as being kind of like, um, something that could be campaigned on in terms of the cost of insurance, in terms of trying to move public opinion more towards a favorable um, perspective on like climate mitigation and renewable energy. Um, I'm happy to jump in, but again, we have a lot of other distinguished folks too. So um, I think if we talk about it, don't talk about it in terms of, from a public perspective, insurance. Talk about it in terms of people losing their homes that there are people, um, last year, according to the Census Bureau, 2.5 million people in the United States were forced out of their homes because of climate issues. Two and a half million people. Um, while we, we had, Noah said in the 80s, we had one billion dollar storm every four months. Last year we had it every three weeks. Billion dollar storm. Um, that the speaker said, I think he said 400 miles of the coastline. 420. I mean, that, that figure blew me away. Um, but even in, you know, in, 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 it's, it, the coastline is awful. I mean, it's challenging, but it's not just the coastline. We all remember in Vermont, that, you know, not anywhere near coast, because the amount of rain that fell in a short time. Um, uh, and it's happening all over the world. You know, 30 million people in Pakistan were forced to move because of, of this. So it is an issue. We have millions of people that are on what's called residual plans, meaning backup state government insurance plans. So the way to make it a public issue, I think, is not to use the word insurance. Talk about homes, cars, people losing the impact. Just like in healthcare, you talk about the impact on the person or their families, and it is a crisis. I mean, literally millions of people who can't get insurance, and for some of them, that means they can't stay in their home. I'll add to that just briefly. Like, I, my mom lives down in Naples, Florida, so I read an article on this, but I used to work in the mortgage business for Bank of America, some large banks. And I remember pulling up, I used to look at how much it would cost to insure a home, uh, you know, two or three thousand dollars for hurricane insurance. And it would always like below the debt to income ratio. Like you'd look at somebody and go, oh, geez, they have to pay an extra, you know, $250 a month to, to insure their home because they're in a uh, hurricane. So I'll take a guess how much it costs now in Florida in a hurricane area annually compared to three thousand dollars back in the mid two thousands. Oh? Twenty five. Twenty thousand. So most of the people are moving to and I've read there's a mass migration now of seniors that are moving to Buffalo, New York. Like and, and to other areas. Not just for the eclipse, I guess. Yeah. And nothing <laughs> wrong with Buffalo or the Bills or anything up there or the bad weather, but it's crazy, right? Like it's so sad. And and I think it's a trickle down effect whether the seniors are getting walloped. That's not fair, you know? Like, my, my mom's doing pretty well, but it's gonna be really hard if, if, like, you know, anything happens to my stepdad, how's she gonna afford that? You know, it keeps you up at night, so. It's just a personal story. Another question? Oh, we got a question back there. Last Is the last one? Okay, good. There you go. Thank you. Uh, the speaker uh, talked in the beginning of this um, this session about how housing is his priority, big priority, and you know it's a big issue for Rhode Island, but it's also a big issue for the rest of the nation. And I can't help but reflect when we're talking about this that the majority of people in our 
country gain wealth through home ownership. That's a critical way to gain wealth. And a lot of these, and you know, if you're owning, and, and also a, a large portion of our country are getting older, right? The rural areas are getting older more quickly. The urban areas are getting older like that. So you have, you know, we're going, we have a country who's aging that, um, you know, who, who have a lot of their um, savings and homes and, um, and and who regularly face these issues. So I would imagine that all of this would affect the housing market. And I would love for you to comment on that. And also, to um, I was sharing with my, my colleague, Sue Lee, um, and, and maybe very similar to what you were saying earlier, I was in um, Katrina and Rita rebuilding in, in Mississippi, and I met an old lady. She owned her home. She had paid her insurance. She had what no one else had. She had the flood insurance and the hurricane. If you know insurance, it's hard to get both of those at the same time. She was an older African-American woman who had gotten those things back in the day, and she was like, had them. And the insurance company said to her, we can't pay your claim because it was horizontal rain. This kind of stuff happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but when that starts happening, for you know, she can fight it, right? This this 80, 85 year old woman could fight it. She did. You know, go to court. By the time it's decided, her, you know, her life is, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe she never got the payout, right? Um, but you start thinking about individual wealth in this country, and you start thinking about issues of equity, um, and how this, you know, kind of affects, you know, kind of the fabric of our infrastructure and our, and our, um, what, what you were saying earlier, you know, it's, it's about the individual, it's about personal income too. It's, it's pretty remarkable. And so I, I was wondering if you would comment on, on, on that respect, on the, on the economic impact that, that you're discussing right here at home ownership. Thank you. I can try. I'm, it's not my. I, mean, I, I think how we have to look at climate. I mean, it's a risk for for everything. I mean, it, and every asset. So everything that we own, really. I mean, especially a home. I mean, it's so. It is extremely difficult when you're looking at you know, the the. I mean, the science forecasts, when you localize them to, to a zip code, I mean, a zip code, you know, it is, it's, when you're looking at, you know, uh, searching for a home and you look at the flood risk map, I mean, it is it, 10, 15, 20 years, there are very few areas that aren't at risk when you're looking, I mean, so it's, and, and I mean, my hometown is, you know, I never saw floods, now, you know, there are floods, you know, many, you know, say 50 percent of the basements of people that I know are flooded and you know on regular basis so I think you know, it's a, it's a huge you know, I think your your statement about equity and this is it's a huge huge risk and it, it is and it's just I mean I want I want to leave this panel with on the high note but I think this is this is not a high note I think this is if we do not electrify <laughs> with clean electricity, the world, with clean electricity, we are, you know, all of our assets, but especially our homes, are going to be at risk. And, and I think any investment in a home is, is risky. And, and that's just, and, that's, and that is going to make it even harder to own a home, to maintain a home, to pay for a home. Insurance is going to be more and more and more difficult. Uh, you know, I, it's just, it's a reality and it's going to exacerbate, it already has exacerbated inequalities if you, it, it, globally and definitely in the U.S. And you're seeing it every, you know, every day with these, with these terrible, you know, high impact storms. So I think that is, I think that's the sort of call to arms, there's a better way to, to say that, but it's, is that's, that's why we've got to all invest locally, you know, we've got to follow the example of, of states like Rhode Island that are investing at the local levels, really electrifying the grid, putting EV, you know, charging, you know, in, in, you know, in office buildings, you know, changing office buildings to be more efficient. We've got to do that, but I mean, we have to do it now.
or, or the risks that you say are just going to get worse? Yeah, no, I think that that's very well said. And I think it's a policy failure that perhaps there is this uh, big insurance gap for what is many Americans' biggest asset. And uh, it, it does have the opportunity to undercut a lot of the positives that we're doing, uh, that Kerry spoke to, in, in result of the Inflation Reduction Act around building additional equity through things like home electrification. So we need to have both sides of that equation solved for. So if people are benefiting from incentives to electrify their home, redo their HVAC, redo their roof, become more energy efficient, and that asset is then uh, protected. So I wholeheartedly agree, and it, it sort of feels like belt and suspenders are the same problem. So hopefully we can get there. Yeah, knowing all that I do, I'm an incurable optimist. I do think so. On the insurance side, banking is regulated at the federal and state level. Insurance is just at the, at the insurance level. And Rhode Island, I've, your commissioner is great here, and there are some states where uh, well, I hope they aspire to be free. I wouldn't put them quite in that category yet. There's a lot of great things happening, but we need to move faster. Um, again, because there are literally millions of people. There's a county in Florida, I just read a study, that the average mortgage price has gone down 4% in the last two years um, because of climate. That's, that's not a lot, but 4% in two years? Think about that in by 2030, 2035. But even with that, because of what our colleague from Schneider said in terms of you know the Inflation Reduction Act and those things, I, I think it's I, I am inspired and also by seeing all of you here and the work you're doing. So think about your retirement, think about where you bank, think about your insurance, and we'd love to join with any of you. Thank you. I'll live with one more thing. I, I think that we should we should have the highest paying jobs in sustainability. My son's 21 years old. I'll brag a little bit, but he got into Caltech and he's doing really well. He studies really hard. Um, and he said, Dad, you know what? The highest paying jobs are with, like right now, for a lot of the people looking for jobs, are with Raytheon and, and, and these big companies that are funding wars. Which, you know, it, it, it is what it is, you know? But like, it's amazing, right? These are the highest paying jobs that are out there for young, brilliant minds. Why would the highest paying jobs be in sustainability for our future? That's just my two cents. I mean, I think sustainability's looked at these roles of like the redhead and stepchild or the marketing arm of these large organizations. And it's wrong. They should be, the person who should be a net zero implementation officer, chief sustainability officer, should be next in line to be CEO of the company. And they should know about finance and they should know everything about the company to drive it forward. And they should be making as much money as the rest of the C-suite and not underpaid. And that's just my two cents to move it forward, so. Give these panelists a big hand. Thank you all so much. And they will be staying around after we're going to have a reception, so you'll have plenty of time to talk. And really, this is the ethos, as I said at the beginning, of what we're trying to do at Fountainhead, bringing perspectives from all over the world and all over the country here, and also blending it with the great work that's being done in Rhode Island. And I'm really excited to introduce this next speaker. He's going to welcome the next panel. I want to give a shout out to a really dear friend, somebody who's been a promoter of Fountainhead over the last almost decade, Melissa Travis, she's the president of the, the Rhode Island Society of CPAs, and she really helped to make this happen. And I'm gonna let Patrick Crowley come to the stage, introduce himself. Patrick Crowley is the secretary treasurer for the Rhode Island AFL-CIO. He's very passionate about this topic, so there's nobody better to introduce the Rhode Island panel. Patrick, thank you. Thank you, Jim. So thank you, Jason, thank you, David, thank you, Melissa, for uh, inviting me here to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Patrick Crowley. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO. We have 80,000 working men and women who are part of our unions across Rhode Island. We are 20% of the workforce, and that is one of the reasons why we say Rhode Island is a labor state. Uh, before I begin my remarks, my remarks, I just want to acknowledge a few of our friends that are here. Congressman Albo is here tonight. Thank you, Congressman, for being here. Uh, yes, uh, we go State Representative Steve Casey is here from the fine city of Woonsocket. Thank you, Steve. And you'll be hearing very shortly from Representative Lauren Carson, who is a complete champion on this issue. So, um, and I'd also like to acknowledge some staff people from our Com Climate Jobs Rhode Island team, Erica Hammond and David Booth. Are here as well. So a couple of years ago, the labor movement recognized one thing that was very interesting that was happening. You know, we were the first state in the, in the nation to build offshore wind. 
and it was the men and women of the Rhode Island building trades that put in those six turbines off the coast of Rhode Island. But we recognized that as this industry was changing, that the labor movement needed to have a significant presence in it. And when you think about how we've done things in Rhode Island, I just want to acknowledge something that just Justice Brandeis said back in 1932. And most of you probably have heard a version of this. But he talked about how states are the laboratories of democracies. What he really said was, a single courageous state could be involved in social and economic experiments in a, such a way that it is without risk to the nation but can prove to the rest of the country how to do things right. Well, Rhode Island is that single courageous state in a lot of different ways. And the Act on Climate, which I know the next panel is going to talk about in depth, is an incredibly important piece of legislation. I would put it up with the IRA, the CHIPS Act, and the Infrastructure Act at, at a state level. And it really is an example. Because here's what this law does. It mandates not just that we are going to be net zero in Rhode Island by the year 2050. It mandates that the state is going to create that economy to get to net zero. Now that is a radically different approach to economic planning and industrial policy that the country has been involved in for the last 50 years. And Rhode Island's approach to it is really unique, and here's why. So the Act on Climate does a couple of things. First, 2050 net zero. That's the easy part. One of 14 states, including the federal government under President Biden, has set that as a goal. But it's how we're getting there. The law mandates that the state needs to be involved in planning, programming, and actions to get to that target number, to create the economy that's going to produce it. It also is mandating that the state every five years has to develop a plan involving every state agency to create that economy. Not only that, but the people that have been impacted the most by the ravages of climate change and have been impacted the most as disadvantaged communities by the current legacy fuel economy have to have a say in what that plan looks like. They have to be at the table crafting what this new economy is going to be. That includes the workers that may be impacted. So a guy driving a fuel truck in South Providence at the port makes $120,000 a year. Someone installing solar panels in your neighborhood is making about $17,000 a year. That's not a fair trade to say, just go install solar panels. Or just go back and learn how to do computer programming. That's not going to work. So what the state is doing is creating an economy that's mindful of how those impacts on working people are going to be taken care of. Now, that's easy to say, right? It's easy to say we're tinkering with the economy, we're making this new economy, blah, 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 blah. Here's how we're doing it, okay? So when you think about what happened after we passed the Act on Climate in 2021, in 2022 we passed the 100% Renewable Energy Standard which says that by 2033, the state of Rhode Island has to uh, procure all of its electricity from renewable energy sources. We'll be the first state in the nation to get to that standard. Second thing that we did as a state was pass an offshore wind procurement, which said that by 2027, we had to have a minimum of 1,000 megawatts of offshore wind produced in the state. The third thing that we did was we passed the Labor Standards Bill, which said that whenever the state is a market player in this economy, or its subdivisions, which means a state agency, a municipality, I would argue that if it was a school committee, whatever the case may be, any political subdivision of the state of Rhode Island is going to be a market player, they have to do three things. First is they have to make sure that the work is going to be conducted with pro-labor standards, meaning that there'll be a project labor agreement or a labor peace agreement, which means that the employer and organized labor have to come to an arrangement for how this project is going to get done. Second thing that they did was they made sure that prevailing wages are going to be paid. Because as I said before, the new economy in the renewable energy sector is rapidly, radically underpaying its workers. The third thing that they did, and this is I think one of the most important parts of it, is that they made sure that apprentices have to be utilized whenever this work gets done. Now why is that important? Because if you look around the legacy fuel economy, and the people that are doing that job, especially here in the Northeast, white and male, 
white and male. The new economy is brown, black, and female faces. It's also an older workforce in the legacy economy. Average construction workers age is 55 years old. And for the first time in 100 years, their sons, and I mean their sons, aren't following them into their crafts. So as we diversify our workforce, the $100,000 jobs that the labor movement has fought for for 50 years is gonna be replaced by brown, black, and female faces making minimum wage jobs. That's entirely unfair. So we've gotta create an economy that lifts them up and keeps them making those family sustaining wages. So here's what we really step back and think about what we do. Act on Climate mandates the states creates a new economy. We pass a law that says that we have to have a 100% renewable energy standard by 2030, 2033. We legislated into existence the demand. We reg legislated into existence the supply by having the offshore wind procurement. And if prices is established by the intersection of the curves of supply and demand, what we've done by having the labor standards component of this is make sure that instead of any profits that are going to be engineered from exploitation and market manipulation, they have to, profits are going to come from innovation and efficiency, which is what this economy needs if we're really going to decarbonize it by the goal of 2050. Now, when you step back and you think about how different that is, how much of a different pro a process from the state, that's a radically different approach, and Rhode Island is going to be the state that gets there first because the way we've engineered this is making sure that working people have a vested interest in doing this. It's a labor state, and we're gonna make sure that labor, along with business, is leading the way to get there. So with that, let me bring up the next panel and uh, introduce them all to you. So Paul, Chris, so we have a number of important people here for you to listen to. Uh, my good friend Lauren Carson, state representative from the second city of Newport. Uh, Chris Kearns, my friend from the, uh, the acting director of the Office of Energy Resources. Terry Gray, the director of the Department of Environmental Management. And I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Paul Ellis. If you haven't had a chance to listen to Paul's podcasts, they're incredibly informative, incredibly interesting, and I think get right to the key of where this intersection of labor, business, and the economy works. So again, Jason, Daniel, David, Melissa, thank you for bringing me on here tonight, and I'm gonna turn things over to Paul. Thank you. Okay, everyone in the audience is sitting down. Stand up. All right. Take it out a little bit. This is relaxed. We've got about, what do you figure, about two hours of presentation <laughs> left? Relax. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so Pat did a very good job of introducing what's coming up from the key people in the um, legislative and policy branches here in the, in the Rhode Island economy. And I've got a few questions for them. We're also going to open the floor questions. And here's the deal. It's got to be this way. Your question has to be a question. From the first word you say, it has to be a question. It has to be very succinct, it has to be very clear, and it has to be asked in less than 30 seconds. Got it? Yeah. We'll get to a lot more questions that way if we, if, if we follow that guideline. All right. So, Sit down, please. Say again. Yes, that's right. So now we're going to. I put together a few questions, but Lauren is going to make some opening remarks um, about about the issues that are on the table now, about the things that Pat discussed, and about the things that are coming up in the next few years. Lauren. Thank you, Paul. Uh, as an elected official, I can't help but want to talk a little bit, so I'm going to do what I do all the time. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to welcome everyone to Rhode Island if you're not from Rhode Island. I represent the great city of Newport, Rhode Island. You are all welcome to go down there and spend a lot of money anytime you want. I always say that. Um, but there were a few things that I wanted to say because I think that I'm setting the stage for being a cheerleader for Rhode Island this evening. And I'm going to talk a little bit for a few minutes about why Rhode Island is really ready for this transition to this economy. The first thing that many of you may or may not know was that the Industrial Revolution started right here, started right here in Rhode Island. 
and it was started in 1790 in the Blackstone Valley. The Blackstone River is about several miles up to our northwest and flies, flows into Massachusetts. And at that time, in 1790, uh, folks used water power to create factories where they were spinning cotton. So we're talking about a history in Rhode Island of uh, capturing transition at the moment. And that the start of that use of that water power led to many, many uh, mills being built up along the uh, Blackstone River all the way up into Massachusetts. So this is our tradition, this is our heritage, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're ready to lead on the transition. Uh, Pat did a wonderful job of talking about the act on climate. Uh, it was a tremendous accomplishment. Right now, we've handed the Act on Climate over to this gentleman, Terry Gray, who has the job of implementing the Act on Climate. Uh, there are a couple things, that, additional things we can say about the Act that Chris, I mean, that Pat didn't say. One is that it's enforceable. So that means if we don't have our climate report ready to go a year from December, which is the goal for really setting out the initial plan, if we don't meet the targeted goals every five years, if we don't renew the plan every five years, citizens can sue the state of Rhode Island. And that was really a, kid, a critical feature of the bill. It's enforceable. It's not something that we're going to just let happen over here. Rhode Island has many strengths and can be a laboratory for a transition to the economies that the panel before us was discussing. What are our strengths? Our congressional delegation. We have one of our members of the we have four members of the delegation from Rhode Island, two congressmen, two senators. I don't need to tell you the work that Senator Whitehouse has done on this. He's by far a champion on this. All four of our champ all four of our members of Congress are champions on climate. Our state legislature is ready to go. We've heard about that, we'll be talking more about that. Our constituents are ready to go. 80, like 84 percent of the citizens of Rhode Island supported the passage of the Act on Climate. We're talking about a culture in Rhode Island where environment is very, very critical. Folks in my district care so much about the environment, that's unbelievable. This is like their number one issue. So we have very aggressive Rhode Islanders here. And we have opportunities. Uh, as Pat said, we were first for wind, solar, we have coasts, we have agriculture and agriculture at the University of Rhode Island. We have the Coastal Research Center, part of the University of Rhode Island, very engaged in transition in the economy, very engaged in agriculture and climate and sea rise. And as Pat said, we have the support of labor. We have very strong coalitions between environment and, level, and labor. So you've touched on this a little bit, why invest? Because people want this. I mean, this is where the economy is going. People are really paying attention. And as our initial speaker, speaker uh, mentioned, you know, it may take a while to get off, but people are really going to pick up increasingly and ask for products and ask for services that are sustainable, that are resilient. I think this is coming. And climate is going to disrupt the way we conduct business. So what are the opportunities in Rhode Island? We are implementing the Act on Climate, enforceable goals, enforceable deadlines, engaging municipalities, labor, EJ communities, municipalities, I've said that, and businesses, critical. We have to be 100% renewable by the year 2033, which, which Pat mentioned. Coastal resilience is next on our agenda. We have this fabulous bay, and you know, we spoke a little bit earlier about the insurance issue and about the flooding. And the interesting thing, I was almost going to pipe up, the interesting thing for me on that flooding issue is that it happens in our own house or our own business, and we're a little bit segregated. But I have found that the increase of storms and the severity of storms in the last six months, many more people are beginning to step up. So will this be a political issue in campaigns? I believe it will be, because people are really starting to see flooding in their streets, flooding in their basements, and once they start talking to each other, they're going to realize they're not alone on that issue. So that is coming, I do believe that. Uh, the next steps for Rhode Island, they're gonna be modernize the grid, get our batteries ready, we need to restore. Uh, we need to store power as we rely increasingly on electric power. We're looking more aggressively at thermal. I know Pat Corley is very involved in that. And as I said, uh, forest, agriculture, and aquaculture are top priorities for, this, for us. Uh, I think that um, you know, one of the other questions is, is commerce ready to welcome businesses perhaps like yours to Rhode Island? And we have an aggressive Department of Commerce. I would encourage anyone to reach out to them, to reach out to the director, Elizabeth Tanner, talk to her about opportunities for investment in Rhode Island. Um, 
I think in closing, before I, I uh, <coughs> you know, we start answering these questions, I read the other day, which I didn't know, that in September 2023, in a particular survey that was conducted by Forbes magazine, Rhode Island was noted as the second most environmental friendly in the country. I didn't even know that, but bravo for us. And the criteria that they used was water policy, solar friendliness, and energy use. Those are the three areas. So we have been recognized. Um, I think that the state government, as the speaker said, is ready to work with the business community. Uh, I think we are all ready to work with the business community. I know that we have the political momentum and we welcome you here and we're ready to do business. So those were my remarks. Thank you. So you mentioned the coastal um, resilience issue. Let's, let's expand on that a little bit. Talk, talk more about how that is impacting, what is it, 400 miles? 420 miles 420 of coastline. Well, uh, Senator Whitehouse always says that the storm gauge at the Newport Naval Station is about 10 inches higher today than it was about 70 years ago. So that's how much the water has risen uh, in Newport, which is uh, down on an island in the southern part of this state. Uh, Again, I have I've, I has, I led an, I led a study commission about eight years ago on the economic impact of sea rise, and I did that because I was a freshman legislator and I'm very strong on environmental policy, and I was afraid that I would be perceived as that environmentalist from Newport, and I thought I don't want to get that reputation my first few years in in office. I'm going to look at the economic impact of this. And what we did was we studied three communities. We studied a small town in southern Rhode Island called Westerly, which was really blown out aggressively by Sandy. We looked at the Providence Port, where all our fuel oil comes for airplanes and home heating, obviously a very important place. And we looked at my community. And uh, so I've had interest in this topic for many, many years. Um, when we we passed the Act on Coasts, and a lot of the uh, political initiative around coastal initiative policy statewide was coming out of Quidnick Island. That's where I live in Newport. And we had a few new freshmen come into office last year from the more southern part of the state. And there's tremendous beach erosion down there. I mean, tremendous beach erosion. And the folks on Equidnick Island, like myself, were really happy that we had some more voices talking about coastal issues. Because up here it's very urban, and folks don't get down to the beach and see the flooding that we're experiencing that much. And we had to really say, hey, you got to come look at this stuff, because it's really serious. So right now we're trying to pass a bill that's called the Act on Coasts, which was a name that I sort of made up because Act on Climate works so well. So now we're looking at Act on Coasts. And I'm hopeful it's going to pass this year. I, I, uh, we have our, our the sponsor is out of Southern Rhode Island. I worked with her on this. We looked at other states, and the, in Rhode Island, the responsibility has been largely municipality by municipality to manage stormwater runoff and to manage beach erosion. And I always say that Sea Rise does not know the town line between Middletown and Newport or adjacent town. It comes right up, right along the beach and the state needs a real plan. And so we're very hopeful this year that the Act on Coast will pass, which will be the sister uh, legislation to Act on Climate. And we will begin looking at the same kinds of things that we did with the Act on Coasts, we're, I mean with Act on Climate, we're gonna do with Act on Coasts. 420 miles of land, you know, exposure is really tremendous and the flooding is really serious. So that's where we're going this year with that. We're very excited that there's, last year when we had the bill, there, two people testified on Acton Coast last year, which really was very disturbing to me. Newport, I mean, Rhode Island's in great shape on energy and, and mitigation and all that, but we really put a lot of effort into trying to build a statewide presence now on coastal issues. I know that the DEM is helping with that. We've hired a coastal resilience officer. So that's a real push to complement the other side of Acton Coast, of the planet. Okay, thank you very much. And let's talk a little bit about, uh, I don't think anyone else has uh, spoken to this particular topic so far this evening, and that is um, low carbon public transportation. What's, what's happening in Rhode Island related to that? And maybe maybe someone else should be for, uh, the person to address it. Chris, I'll, ahead, I'll take ahead, a shot sorry. on that one. Um, so, so my name is Terry Gray, and I'm, I'm the chair of something called the Executive Climate Change Coordinating Council. And that was established in the Act on Climate 
as a, essentially the governor's climate cabinet, if you will. There's 13 agencies named in the Act on Climate that, that are participants. Chris uh, Kearns to my, to my right here is the, is the vice chair. And um, we've added a bunch of other agencies as well. So we're really trying to engage across the administration in terms of our efforts to uh, reduce greenhouse gases. One of the big things is public transportation, like you said. Um, transportation as a whole makes up 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions in the state. So when we look, obviously we're looking at passenger vehicles, we're looking at fleet vehicles, we're looking at the charging infrastructure to support that transition. Um, we're, we're combining incentives, which mostly come out of Chris's office, with regulations that of course come out of my office, and, and really trying to drive that change in the transportation sector. In terms of public transportation, a few years ago, we were part of a national settlement with Volkswagen and we received a lot of funds to, um, to really invest in whatever we needed to, to promote transportation. What Rhode Island did was we invested that in our Rhode Island Public Transportation Agency of Ripta. And it's really given them a jump start to really start to electrify their buses and invest in the charging infrastructure to support that investment. It's, um, it's a slow go. These, um, these buses cost almost a million dollars a piece. The, the infrastructure is challenging and they've been working through that on how to charge the buses. And it also it's a different ride and it's a different maintenance. So, so working with the drivers and, the, and the, um, the people that maintain the buses has been, has been a major focus for them. But they're moving along. Um, they're one of the, uh, the most popular and most heavily used routes is Route R which um, goes through some of our um, disadvantaged communities in the, in the state, um, that's an all electric line. And then uh, RIPTA has goals to electrify all the lines or electrify all the buses um, that service Aquidneck Island. Um, that, that's their goal. It's also transitioning now into school buses, which is, uh, which is really, I think, uh, a groundbreaking uh, new area. If we can get electric buses in front of our kids, it really starts to send a message that, that this is the future. And not only that, but these buses don't have any emissions, right? So they're much healthier for the kids and the drivers um, and the school environment to be to bring service in those. We don't have a lot of EV buses in the, in the uh, school bus sector yet, but, but it's something that we're working on. We have pockets of success, but especially in the city of Providence, and, and that's really working. Okay. Turn it back to you, Chris. Okay. Specific, really clear questions on coastal resilience and public <coughs> transportation. Who's first? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, what do you think the potential is for expanding um, rail transit? Because um, I know that the T, you know, it goes all the way out to Wickford. And then um, they have obviously the Amtrak lines, but that Rhode Island doesn't have a lot of. It. I'm sorry, this is not shorter than 30 seconds. I didn't phrase the formal question either. Um, what do you think the potential for expanding rail transit is in uh, Rhode Island, or even the potential in uh, Providence alone for uh, like a tram line, for example? Well, I can not my area of expertise, but I can tell you a couple of things. First of all, the Department of Transportation recently submitted their own carbon reduction plan. And there's a, there's a pretty significant element in that plan to expand the, the T lines that already exist. So more frequent routes, um, more incentives for people to ride, hopefully get some cars off the road, get some congestion mitigation, and really start to build that ridership better. In terms of our, our own approach, we've looked at the, um, well, first of all, let me back up. It's a huge chance time of opportunity right now with federal funding and federal grants. And we recently submitted a climate mitigation grant to, um, to EPA. And part of that element was to look at microtransit. And they're not trolleys, but it, it's, it's small sort of shuttles that run around, run around some of our, our urban areas. Then, and we're hoping that that grant is, is, um, is approved and we can support the development of that. I'd love to speak to that. I, um, I think there needs to be more incentives, and I don't really know what they are right now. And it, it, this is something that I think about a lot, but I don't have a solution for. I 
thought about it as recently as this afternoon, driving up here, and I was on Route 95, as, which is right out the window, and I thought, how, how are we gonna get these people out of their cars? I ask that question all the time. How are we going to do this? It's convenient, we're an automobile society, we have to figure out a way, I think, working with younger people. We have to do several, we have to do a lot of different things. We have to work with younger people. We have to make housing in areas where there's transit. You know, there's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. And I just thought this today, driving, I see old, and it was 2.30 in the afternoon, and the highway was jammed with cars. You know, I, I, think, I think that it's gonna be hard to get people out of their cars. I think that we need to put a little bit more uh, thinking into it. Um, because we kind of like that on the way home we can stop and pick up the kid at daycare and then go to the store and then go to the drugstore and then go home. You can't really do that on a bus, you know. So it needs much more imagination, I think. Um, and I, I'm personally concerned about that. Okay. Uh, one, more, uh, one more question about... Thank you. So we do have this back in space. And what can we do to utilize the base sustainably? How can Rhode Island companies, Rhode Island residents, ask government to do things like supporting small electric high-speed ferries across the water. Not a lot of congestion out there, and with all the congestion on the bridges, the bay seems like an unbelievable place to help people commute and sustain it. I think they did use the, the, the ferries a little bit. We had a, a, a potential major disaster on one of our bridges here, just before the holidays, and it, we had to close it off. It wasn't, it wasn't what happened in Baltimore, thank God, but it could have been, okay? Uh, we, diverted, we averted that situation. And so the traffic in and around the city has been that, uh, just disastrous since December. And I think they tried to move some folks on ferries, but there wasn't really much luck with that. But I think we're gonna have to replace this bridge. And I think that we're working right now to figure out a way the Department of Transportation is to, you, it, it, maybe using the ferries in December wasn't a real good idea. It's kind of cold out there on the water, you know, I don't know. Uh, but now that the warmer weather's coming, it looks like we need to replace this bridge. I think that there's going to be more calls to use the ferry, particularly in the summer months. I don't know. Do you guys know anything about that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, they, uh, we're in active conversations right now to put together a clean ports grant to EPA, and one of the one of the elements in that is is hopefully to electrify the ferry system on the bay. So, um, like Representative Carson said, there's there's uh, there's work to do to promote ridership. But we're, we're, we're actively looking at, at, at making the ride cleaner, let's put it that way. Um, our Commerce um, Rhode Island Department has really, uh, has really invested in um, clean transportation. There's a company called Region that is, um, is developing a cool electric sort of seaplane shuttle, and that's based in Quonset Point Industrial Park, right on Narragansett Bay. Um, but probably more importantly, the um, Commerce is working with the URI Foundation to develop a plan called the Blue Economy Plan. And the Blue Economy Plan looks at ways to, um, to take advantage of that asset, Narragansett Bay, and look at the, the economic development and innovation opportunities based on sort of water technologies. A lot of that is based on offshore wind. How can we support the offshore wind industry as it develops? But there's a, a lot of it also is, is looking at the defense industry. And there's a lot of defense industry still, um, still very active in, in Newport in particular. And, and um, there's a lot of work being done on the Bay to really, to really look at that, including opportunities to develop a smart Bay monitoring network. And we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Okay. Chris, renewable energy. It's all the rage, right? Uh, in, in a lot of places, Rhode Island uh, particularly, and there's a lot of different components to that. There's also a lot of federal money available for capitalizing projects. How is that unfolding in your experience here? Yeah, so I mean, um, Pat pretty much uh, did a great job covering everything that we're doing. I was just like, let him keep speaking. He's got, he's got it down. Uh, no, in terms of, I think Pat's highlighted some of the things in terms of uh, obviously, we have the 100% renewable energy standard by 2033 that the, the General Assembly passed in 2022, uh, in, in addition to the offshore wind uh, procurement uh, law, um, and more recently, the uh, revamped 
uh, state solar programs in terms of solar siting related issues and trying to promote uh, further project development on ground fields and landfills. Certainly a lot of those projects are going to leverage uh, the clean energy related tax credits from the, the IRA uh, that was passed in August of 2022. Um, so we're very um, active in terms of on our electricity side in terms of implementing Act on Climate. Uh, very excited. I think we're about T minus just under maybe two months. Last time I checked in terms of Revolution Wind uh, starting construction out at sea. Uh, that's a project that we uh, started way back in uh, 2018 uh, and then went through the regulatory process at the state level um, and then more recently wrapped up the federal permitting process this past fall. Um, so that will be Rhode Island's uh, second offshore wind project and uh, we are currently in the, the, the thick of it. In terms of the evaluation, uh, my colleague uh, Karen Bradbury here from OER uh, evaluating with Massachusetts and Connecticut the next uh, wave of project proposals that are under evaluation. So a lot of ha happening at the at the state level. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, earlier this week to receive just uh, um, just under fifty million dollars from the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level for uh, solar development within the low. Um, uh, income community and our distressed communities. Uh, so we're uh, getting the beginning stages of working with EPA to secure those uh, federal dollars here in Rhode Island for uh, further solar development. So very active in terms of trying to maximize all applicable uh, federal incentives that are available now, but also uh, trying to get as much money uh, here in Rhode Island uh, by the fall time frame. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a, a, a new question into the hopper here. Let's talk a little bit about the America's Cup, because in our prep call, I think all three of you were very enthusiastic about the way that that sporting event has influenced the whole industry in terms of the, the materials that are used to develop things like wind farms and uh, you know, things that are a key, there are key elements or key components of all of the new energy uh, development that's happened, clean energy development. Let's talk about that a little bit because it really is the historical aspect of the, the economy and also just the physical space and the ocean here in Rhode Island. What, is that, what has that been like in the past? Well, if I may make a correction, we lost the America's Cup in the 70s. So it's not that that went someplace else. What we have is the ocean race. Okay. And so uh, Volvo created a world round, a wor around the world ocean race. I don't know when, but a couple of times it's been to Newport. I don't they initiated it then. It comes about every three years. And Volvo no longer handles it. It's just called the ocean race now. And there's about seven or ten spots around the world. It starts in Spain, I believe, and it goes around uh, Africa, and then it goes over to the east, and, or well, actually, it's, travel, it's traveling east, and it goes into like somewhere in Southeast Asia, and then it goes around South America and stops in Argentina, I believe, or Brazil, and then the only place it stops in the United States is in my district. So that's a wonderful thing. And uh, sailing, we have a tremendous heritage of sailing in Newport because of the America's Cup. Uh, and they do an interesting thing at the, when the America's, when it's, it goes to a state park in Newport and it's there for like about two weeks. And it's interesting because they, the boats come in, uh, it's a race, right? So the boats come in and I live about maybe a half a mile from the harbor and it was the middle of the night and you could hear people screaming and cheering because the first boat could be seen. That was two, two races ago, and it was like four o'clock in the morning, and people were waking up because as soon as the first boat came in, that meant the boats were right there. And it happened to have been a boat from the United States, from Rhode Island, so there was tremendous enthusiasm for that. But the uh, interesting thing is that there's an organization called 11th Hour Racing, which I believe was funded with some, I don't know, um, not Google money, but, um, some other computer company money, I can't think of it right now. And they, they, they really want to promote uh, uh, res resilience and sustainability on the water, and it's a big part of the race. 
and they take that message all over the world. And when they're in Newport, they may do this in other parts of the world too, but when they're in Newport, they have a big event like this and they invite, they have all the sailors come and they talk about what they've seen around the world and they talk about how important sustainability is. They're trying to bring it onto the land. So they're worth reading about, 11th Hour Racing. They're located right in Newport, as a matter of fact. One thing that I'll tell you is that one of the sessions they took pictures and the sailors had photographs on big screens, like two or three times the size of this. And the plastic waste around the world was absolutely horrifying. I mean, horrifying. I will never forget it. They were in Vietnam and they had a picture of a river and there was just, it was just completely loaded with plastic waste. I mean, it was just horrible. And these sailors were really affected by this. Uh, you know, and here in Rhode Island, we're working very hard to minimize plastic. We work very hard to minimize plastic straws, and I'm like, straws, my God, you should see what this river looks like, you know? So that's the lesson that they have shared with uh, the sailing community internationally. Also, there's a UN effort, I believe, as well, because uh, when they were here last year, there is a UN resolution that was being passed about sustainability. They, they wanted to bring sustainability from the shore onto the land, and they worked with myself and another colleague, and we got a resolution passed in the House to support those efforts. So it has been, uh, you know, have, it, ha it has been educational, actually, for Rhode Islanders, to say the least. Now, we also have a very strong marine trades economy in Newport, which we didn't touch on. Uh, and they're working in a whole variety of areas and they understand sustainability. I'm not an expert on their programs. I don't know if one of these guys are, but um, you know, so that's a very highly visible uh, industry in this state, very highly visible. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, if I could add a little bit, when you, um, when you talk about the America's Cup and the ocean rates, what you're talking about is high performance sailing. And, um, and what is unique in these, in these um, races is the degree of innovation that companies invest in, in designing and trying out new technologies and new materials in particular. If you go back to the America's Cup, there was this big controversy because one of the boats came up with a wing keel. And this was the first, the first opportunity for a boat to get out of the water and do a little hydroplaning and then go really fast. That's nothing compared to the, the boats that we're seeing now in, in, the, in the ocean race. But it was pretty cool and it, it was innovated here. Um, a lot of the companies in the eastern part of the state along the East Bay really focus on composites and fiberglass, <coughs> light, um, innovative materials because the boats have to be light, they have to be strong, and they have to be flexible in order to get the speed necessary to compete in these races. And, and that, that's kind of a, a special skill set that's not often recognized in the state. And now that skill set is, is being extended to the blades, turbine blades for offshore wind, onshore wind, and also for the bodies for, uh, for the EV buses that we talked about. Lightness is key in order, to get, in order to get distance. Strength is key in order to get resiliency and, and, and have these products last. And all of those skill sets are kind of embedded in the, um, in the marine trades industry here in Rhode Island and they're starting to get tapped into the new, the new sort of carbon-free economy. So we're really talking about labor issues. We're also talking about all of the, the materials that are used, and we're also talking about technologies that are being developed right here in Rhode Island that may or may not be developed in many other places around the country. I think that's true, but in addition to that, there's a lot of training going on in this industry as well. A lot of training. I know the marine trades industry really recruits young people. Uh, they work with them in high school. They bring them into this industry, particularly what, what Terry was talking about. So he's correct. It's really a big a big move. Right. So let's move away from the water. Well, well first of all, right, up, right over here. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Uh, please. I'm wondering in the, uh, with the Act on Climate, what you see as the bills that are currently pending in the uh, state legislature that would have the biggest impact on meeting those goals? Well, we, uh, we're looking, there, as, a, as Terry said, and as I know we all agree, uh, you know, buildings and transportation are the biggest culprits to emissions. 
And so we have several bills, and there's several people here I know that are encouraging these bills for building decarbonization and really looking at those kinds of uh, efforts. Uh, uh, looking, we're looking at thermal to so trying to get, we're trying to tackle those areas where there is the most emissions. Uh, so the biggest issues right now in the Environment Committee, we're on the Vice Chair, and I just polled all the members this week as to what their top priorities are. Uh, one is building decarb. One is an Environmental Justice Act, which we've been trying to pass, and that's critical because the Act on Climate does require participation from the environmental justice community, and that really maps out a whole series of ways that our, uh, environmental justice communities can participate in environmental futures. And then the last is the Act on Coasts. Those are the three right now that a majority of the members of the Environment Committee in the House think are the top priorities. Right. Yeah, I would just add, just in terms of um, the General Assembly has been very active the last uh, three plus years, and the, the timing worked out in terms of Act on Climate was passed and signed in 2021, uh, and then the uh, between the Infrastructure Law and then the uh, Inflation Reduction Act laws uh, passage, we have a lot of federal funding uh, to implement that's going to really drive home in terms of implementing Act on Climate. Again, there's a number of state laws. The, renewable energy standard, offshore wind procurement, extending out our state energy efficiency programs uh, through the end of this decade that the legislature has acted upon over the last three years. Uh, but we have a 20 plus million dollar heat pump program that we launched in September. Uh, we have um, the 20 plus million dollar electric uh, vehicle charging infrastructure program. We're in currently installing uh, EV charging infrastructure uh, along Route 95 in Hopkinton and Warwick. Uh, we're currently uh, wrapping up our public comment period for the balance of that funding to implement on private and public uh, parking lots, about $20 million um, over the next few years. Um, again, we just got the $49 million grant from EPA for uh, solar development within our low-income uh, community. Uh, Karen and Steve here uh, in the back, they've been working hard in terms of getting the applications prepared uh, for roughly $64 million in home electrification funding. Uh, money that's coming to us. Uh, they're working on uh, a lot of energy training related grants um, that are underway. We just got an announcement, I think, from EPAs on some additional um, EV charging infrastructure with uh, um, heavy duty uh, vehicles. DEM just submitted their significant application for uh, funding. So there's a lot of federal dollars um, that are really going to drive home, particularly the, the thermal and the transportation side. We have a lot of state level programs for on the electricity front. Uh, but thermal and transportation, a lot of the, uh, the federal funding that we're uh, securing right now or deploying is really going to play a critical role in, with Act on Climate over the next several years. Okay, other questions? Thank you. Um, so you're talking a lot about electrification, both of vehicles and homes. And I know you mentioned modernization of the grid as kind of one of the elements of that act with interest batteries. We actually need to begin working on that more aggressively, more accurately. Okay. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask, so maybe that answers the question, but I was just going to ask, I'm in Massachusetts, and I know on like exceptionally cold days, parts of the grid lose power because of overload and with all the physical hazards that we talked about, with all the storms and things like that, the grid's more, more susceptible to failures and so I'm just wondering how you perceive that like being part of all this electrification process. We need to partner with the utility. The, the utility we have one we only have one utility in the state. They have they provide about ninety five to ninety eight percent of the power electric power uh, to the entire state. And then we have a few two small ones, right? There's two little ones. Yeah and I would um, just to add um, uh, again part of the the IRA laws. We have a lot of uh, grid resiliency funding that we're going to be receiving that we're currently designing the program for our respective three utilities to be able to apply to in terms of Rhode Island Energy, Pasco Utility, and, and Block Island uh, Utility District. Uh, Rhode Island Energy received roughly a $50 million grant from the Department of Energy for uh, grid resiliency related efforts back in October. Um, so again, we're just kind of last 12, 18 months uh, with the OER team applying, applying, applying for all this federal funding laying the foundation, I think we're going to start to see a lot of that money start to trickle out uh, into the local economy in the second half of this year into uh, to, uh, 2025. And what I was going to add is that um, the, the, one of the first critical uh, plans for the Act on Climate is coming out of the uh, EC4 that Terry chairs, and that should be out a year from December. And the utility, I know, is very interested in being 
along being a partner in that and understanding where that plan is going because that's going to begin to really set the, the plan in motion uh, and so they're they're not waiting for that but they're they know that that's going to require some changes in the grid so coupled with these investments and coupled with that plan we will then be able to really look more aggressively with the utility at grid security so we're talking a lot about job creation funding for projects and a lot of things that are, are happening either on the water or close to the water let's move back on to the land and talk about agriculture a little bit terry all right, so you're probably smiling because we're talking about Rhode Island agriculture, and you're probably thinking that there's probably farms in Kansas that are bigger than Rhode Island, right? <laughs> but, um, but we actually have a very active agriculture community. Um, the USDA just came out with a national agriculture census, and two things that stood out for Rhode Island was, one, we're one of the only states in the country with the amount of land under agriculture actually grew in the last five years. And the other piece was that we have the highest percentage of new young farmers coming into the industry. And a lot of these farmers are looking at, at small pieces of land, specialty crops across the state, and, and really looking at opportunities to, to get established in, in the sector. Um, obviously, a lot, of, a lot of farming really depends on sustainable and regenerative agriculture techniques. So we're spending a lot of time with our partners at the Natural Resource Conservation Service to look at funding opportunities, again, it's the time of opportunity with the federal government. And that extends to farm and working land as well. And really looking at, at how we can, we can get these um, practices established in our agricultural properties. Um, we're also partnering with a bunch of states under something called the U.S. Climate Alliance to, um, to bring in a, a, a fellow specifically to look at um, land management practices in forests, in farms, and, and in recreational lands. DEM manages like 68,000 acres of property, which is a big deal in Rhode Island, right? We're small. Um, and we want to make, make sure that we maximize the carbon value out of the management techniques that we uh, we address these lands in. And then we extend that out to privately farmed lands as well. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, we're really looking at it um, with respect to both carbon storage, but also minimizing the emissions from farming practices as well. And I think I think um, we have a very receptive audience in the agriculture community in the state. So it's working well. Chris or Lauren, any additional comments? <laughs> and one of the things that Chris has had is, is a very strong program to allow some of our agricultural um, landowners to invest in some ground-mounted solar. And it's not, it doesn't take the majority of it, but what it does is it takes the pressure off the economics of, of getting the most out of that land. And it really supports the, their ability to continue farming and to continue to work. Land is very expensive in Rhode Island. And in terms of farmland, it's probably the most expensive land in the country. Um, so anything we can do to support the agricultural community and keep them vibrant is, um, is very much appreciated. And Chris has really invested quite a bit through his program in, in helping them out through, through small solar investments. Okay. Jason, we have time for any other questions or do you think we should move on? Okay. My final pressing question. <laughs> okay, who's got it? Back there. Back to back. Oh, oh, you're ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just want to disrupt the flow of the themes and conversations, but what I keep hearing is a lot of great discussions, but one thing that feels missing, and you touched on a little bit, is the waste management stream and how we manage you know, the landfill filling up in you know, state landfill and the other, you know, anything we're doing to minimize the amount of you know, reduce and you know, our our growth of you know we're building new we're talking about new buses and new new things that we're building but what are we doing to address waste in the state? I guess that's my wheelhouse, right? <laughs> um, we are that is part of our agenda and part of our plan. Um, I can start with organics diversion. That's a big. Um, this is food waste and preventing food waste in a lot of ways. 
so we're really we're really trying to focus on the opportunity to to enhance composting and anaerobic digestion in the state so that that material is not taking up landfill space and generating methane in an anaerobic landfill environment so um, so that's a big a big focus we're in the process right now of updating our solid waste plan for the for the entire um, state of Rhode Island and that that's a huge focus um, Representative Carson mentioned plastics, right? So plastics remains a big core of our sustainability. There's a lot of good, um, innovative pieces of legislation. They, they get passed in the House and the Senate, and they come to us for implementation. So we're working on, on, on making those happen as well, and there's a lot more in the harbor. Um, I, think, I think extending the, um, the management of organics down to the household level is really is really what we're focusing on right now. So curbside pickup, separation, and then making sure that we have the capacity to treat that stuff on the back end is, is something that we're focused on quite a bit. And there's a very high demand for that in Rhode Island to take care of this stuff. Very high demand. Okay, Jason, I'm so glad that you invited me to participate today because I got a lot of ideas to take back to the people in New York now. <laughs> Well, big hand for this panel and Sydney Paul Ellis for joining us today. Uh, one of the top podcasts in the country and we're really proud to have them. And, I, and I'll make a point, uh, on the anaerobic digestion, I got to start off the week at my alma mater, Bright University, there's a few students here, and we actually cut the ribbon on the first anaerobic digester on campus. So, big shout out to Taylor Baby and the students, I think that's going to build the cycle, or the flywheel, if you like to call it. So I think everybody could, could see today, and we're, we're wrapping up, we've had incredible support from the state for this event. I'm eternally grateful to everybody from speak, Speaker Shikarcho all the way down. We're going to close off with one more treat. And I know Scott said at the beginning that I'm somebody that returns calls and gets back quickly. Well, this person certainly in Rhode Island needs no introduction, but he's somebody, no matter when I've reached out, no matter how busy he is here in Rhode Island or in Washington, D.C., he's always returned the call. And I'm really proud to have him here today representing the 1st Congressional District in Rhode Island, Congressman Gabe Amo. Congressman. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. And I, I've been in politics uh, as an elected official only six months now. But I've been around it a long time to know uh, when you are the person between the people and the booze, you go quickly. <laughs> so I, I will do just that. I want to acknowledge the great leaders that we have in uh, this state, uh, many of whom uh, you have met for the first time, for those who are just uh, visiting with us. But I hope you see the energy that we have here uh, from our, our state representatives who are present. Uh, to our great uh, agency leaders. Uh, of course, uh, labor leads the way because this is powered by working people. You see that we're all in this together. And we're all in this together because Rhode Island knows the stakes are extremely high. Uh, we are experiencing the consequences, the challenges, and, and hopefully uh, not the, the, the final conclusion of the efforts on climate change. Rather, we need to move aggressively here uh, to be a model to the rest of the country. And I think we are starting to do just that. And you have uh, a combination of, of folks from government, uh, from the private sector, our research uh, institutions, our nonprofits, who are assembled to take advantage of this historic moment. I had the opportunity before I was elected to Congress to uh, work uh, at the White House, I served as the Deputy Director Intergovernmental Affairs for President Biden uh, for uh, all of the efforts to uh, make sure that we secure uh, these historic investments from the infrastructure law, uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and now I get to work on the other side of the ledger, ledger to make sure that Rhode Island gets as much as possible. Uh, I also serve right now on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee uh, in, in the House of Representatives. And why that's a, a, an especially important place for me to be is that we are going to uh, need to continue to invest in a lot of the research and development that is necessary to advance and, and grow the technological uh, uh, foundations that uh, th these funds will go to support. And so while you know, this task is, is big, 
And while it, it, it seems insurmountable, especially as we continue to deal with the, the real consequences uh, in, in our daily lives, I'm hopeful, I'm very optimistic uh, because of rooms like these, because of the great work of groups like Fountainhead Rhode Island who had the visionary leadership to assemble here today. I know that we are on a, a great path toward success, but uh, I also know that it is fraught with distraction, uh, fraught uh, uh, with uh, a lot of, of voices who will uh, speak against uh, changing the way that we do business. Why not? Path dependence has worked so well for us already. Right. It hasn't. It hasn't. So I thank all of you uh, for being here in this room, but uh, for those of you not from Rhode Island, uh, I, I have a, a special task to do. Because I usually I tell people I don't speak for free. They leave people with jobs. One is get to know the Rhode Islanders who are here. Get to know those who are present, who you have spoken with, who uh, have made commitments uh, to make sure that Rhode Islander is a leading, leading voice in the space. Two, uh, when you leave, Tell people about the conversations you had here in Rhode Island. And three, come back. Uh, spend your dollars here, of course, but better yet, give us your ideas, give us your talents, give us your, uh, your efforts and your sweat equity, because I know uh, that we are doing uh, great things here and I'm hopeful that you'll be part of it. So thank you so much for being here, and I'll give away the mic so you can get to a beverage. And the very last thing, I promise, but no Fountainhead event would happen or ground out without hearing from my esteemed co-founder and really the linchpin of what makes a lot of this tick, David Almonte. So I want to welcome David to give final remarks and thank our sponsors. And then we're off. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, you're off the hook. Apparently I am the one standing in between everybody in the bar, so appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, I did whittle this down, so I'll try to make it quick. For those that don't know me, my name is David Almonte. I'm one of the co-founders of Fountainhead Rhode Island. And obviously, we're doing incredible things here. I think we'll just be prudent to take a minute just to tell you a little bit about Fountainhead Rhode Island and what we're doing. The goal of our organization is to connect like-minded, diverse business and community leaders from all over here in Rhode Island, across the country, who share a similar passion, vision, and ambition for moving their communities forward. We host educational panel events like the one here tonight, as well as live virtual community spotlights, fireside chats, and experiential networking events like the virtual whiskey tasting we held last night. As you can probably tell, Fountainhead Rhode Island is bigger than just networking. It's about education and giving back to communities in which we live, work, and serve. It's about lifting up and empowering those around us along the way. I'll leave you with this. Today's event is certainly important, and I was catching up with Congressman Amo beforehand, but what's even more important is what you do from this moment on. So I challenge each of you to take what you learned, connect with the people here, but then go back to your local communities and get involved. Give back and empower others along the way. Thank you.